Okay, so good morning everyone. So I'm presenting today my preliminary result from my master's studies I initiated earlier this year. And I've been working on the population genetic structure of the common school pond along the South African coast. So just to start off is that the common school ponds are the consequence of them being much more uh, unfair is that they are much more valuable and have higher preference over other species by consumers. They are also caught as bycatch in the hate long line as well as trolls, as well as an increase in demand and as well as an increase in exploitation for shark fillers in Asian and Australian countries has also been a contributing factor. And these attributes have in turn resulted in the species being listed globally as vulnerable by the International Agreement for Conservation of Nature, RAPES. So recent reports suggesting uh, wild population declines among population stores of commercial shark species um, have, uh, due to legal as well as illegal, uh, illegal fisheries um, has resulted in us hoping to actually try and understand the, knowledge, the levels of genetic diversity as well as the patterns of gene flow so we can be able to discern future management units for conservation and as well as for management. And currently the population genetic structure of the common small harm shark both globally and uh, regionally here, particularly in South Africa, is not known. So that is why we are set out with the aim of our March project is among the aims is to actually test for gene flow, gene flow being the reproductive, uh, which is the movement of individuals from different populations into other populations and then, and then they mix and they mate. And uh, that in a whole creates a, a one large and limited population, which is a hypothesis of Pemexia. Or the alternative hypothesis that it is an existence of two or more stocks indicating that there is some degree of population subdivision along the South African coast. And in order to achieve this, what we set out to do was to genotype the seven something site that we managed to get our hands on currently of a total of 110 individuals and to assess the levels of genetic diversity amongst the study populations. And the ultimate objective being that we would like to evaluate the degree of population differentiation between the populations along the South African coast. So the seven sampling sites that we have, although the sample size are very, are very small, is that we have samples from Nalabon Bergen populations as well as Robben Island, and these two populations are actually above the traditionally recognized biogeographical barrier, which has held strong in restricting gene flow for many marine organisms. Uh, but interestingly enough is that this barrier did not seem to restrict any gene flow for the toe shark as well as the copper sharks, since samples from around about there did not show any population differentiation from samples from up to Namibia. And uh, below that barrier, we have samples from uh, False Bay and Gal Bay, and then from uh, Gullis Bank. And these five populations over here represent the Atlantic Ocean populations. And we also have samples, we, we had a Jeffreys Bay population, which was going to represent the Indian Ocean populations, and we managed to get samples from the Sharks Board for a different project, and I've decided just to add them on for, for this particular, uh, for, for, for the presentation, just to see just to illustrate the differences that we can see with the Atlantic populations versus the Indian Ocean. So, as the species has very limited genetic information, is that in order to uh, do conduct a population genetic study, is that we have to first um, develop uh, molecular genetic markers, which are a prerequisite for population genetic study. And we decided to go through the cross-species amplification route, which is a transfer of primers from close related species to the target species, the one that you're trying to actually develop markers for. And uh, Microsoft Lab markers, which are uh, a repetitive sequence of one to six base pairs in the genome, and they're highly variable, which obviously that's why they're suited for population genetic study. And from these two papers, luckily in 2012, the was a Marcus Marcus Tuck, Marcus that were published for the Masterless Henry as well as Masterless Canis that were actually shown to be actually closely related to the Masterless Masterless. And we selected those markers and we did cross species amplification. And then here I'm just showing an example of the MH2 from the Masterless Henry marker as well as the MH9, which uh, showed um, successful amplification on your Agros gel, which is a gel that can discriminate uh, between fragments that are around about 100 to 150 base pairs. And markers such as these that show robust amplification on the page, on the Eglos gel, are then has, would then have to be evaluated for polymorphism to see if these markers actually demonstrate alternative forms, which we refer to them, of different band sizes, which we refer to them as alleles. And in here, now, if you take image 2 and you run it, you use a higher resolution gel, such as page gel, which um, can discriminate between fragments that are at least uh, one base pair difference. 
And uh, you can see that this monk is putting all this, as you can distinguish uh, around about the number of uh, different fragments, uh, different base pairs there. And then after evaluating for polymorphism, we had to select uh, markers that were uh, polymorphic to actually establish two multiplex systems which constitute of um, six microsatellite markers, each of which were then used to recover the electrophoresis to genotype the study populations. And then we use a program big scanner to do. And then there, uh, here's just an example where you can see that this is a virtuosite pair. This might be an individual that represents two different um, alleles and different uh, fragment sizes. And so just to look at the, the genetic data analysis is that uh, we had to address, uh, we first had to address the question of whether there is one stock, um, if there's two or more stocks. And to do that, we had to test the hypothesis of one stock and over the alternative hypothesis that there's two or more stocks present along the South African coast. And then we conducted the molecular genetic data analysis, and this is because the level was at a 5% on the level. And then yet again, you have to, um, Address <coughs> whether the statistics are significant or non significant, and should they be, it means yes, there is population structure, and therefore you can say with, I mean, you can say with certainty that there seems to be, uh, you think that they, they, they can be managed as a separate unit. However, should the statistics not be non significant, it means that you just have one larger intermediate population, and obviously some have said that you can manage a population as one unit. However, that's debatable since the genetic connectivity does not necessarily imply that your populations are also demographically dependent. And both of these results obviously has implications for the management and trade of the species. So looking at the results for the genetic diversity is that what we detected currently, although the sample size as I mentioned is very small, is that we've managed to detect comparable levels of genetic diversity um, across all the study populations. And in here I'm just representing them as in the form of LA patterns where we use the genetic indices such as the number of adults, which is the average number now we've taken all the multi-level genetic data, and you can see here that the uh, mean number of values are actually comparable, which is ridiculous, and then the number of lower and island populations seems to have the highest uh, number of alleles. The number of effective alleles here, which of the alleles that can be present <coughs> at that population, obviously <coughs> uh, it seems to be obviously comparable across populations, and the Shannon's Information Index, which quantifies genetic diversity in one population relative to the other one, also seems to show that it seems to be also comparable in telling us that obviously we can suppose the, that the genetic diversity indices are actually comparable. We're just looking at it. And then the number of private adults, which are adults that um, are unique to a particular population, are only segregating that population. And you can see this is very, uh, they're very comparable with an exception of the Robben Island population that seems to only have the highest number of those adults that are segregated in that population. Mm -hmm. And then the and, uh, expected heterozygosity levels, which is also a measure of uh, polymorphism within the populations, as well sort of be consistent, sort of be consistent, um, sort of be comparable across generations. And then the dip that we see here in all of the genetic uh, diversity indices is a result of the small sample size that we have. Mm -hmm. So looking at the results of population structure, is that we use the analysis of molecular variance, which is a technique of actually, which is a method of studying a molecular variation and how it pattern, and how it gets partitioned uh, amongst uh, populations. And this particular statistical test detected that there were significant um, differences amongst the populations, which is that moderate six percent, and then also detected significant differences among among individuals within populations, which is at 5%. And the largest molecular variance was within populations themselves, indicating that the levels of inbreeding, inbreeding meaning that it's a mating of related individuals, was very negligible, or was very low to negligible. So another method to actually assess population genetic structure is that we use a peer-wise FST estimate. And now this method requires that you have to predefine your populations, just like the rover, and then it just does it from case a population paper pairwise to actually determine the genetic distance between the populations. And it also supports the results of the molecular variance as it detected um, significant differentiate, moderate differentiation between the cafe population and the lama monolithic population, as well as um, the lama Robin island versus the cafe population. Now interesting here is that the sterling population which represents the Atlantic Ocean seems to have shown a, a large genetic distance or large genetic population differentiation in comparison to the rest of the other sampling populations along the South African coast. So now looking at that, well, visually on representing the molecular variation on a 3D vectoral plane, is that this particular uh, 
the FCA, the Petroleum Cross Performance Cell Support, now visually shows the patterns of population genetic structure, where now we can clearly see that the different population clusters separately from the rest of the populations, which obviously are the Atlantic clusters, so the Atlantic Ocean populations, and that is an Atlantic Atlantic uh, is an Indian Ocean population. But interestingly enough, it was that the Jeffreys Bay population, which is meant to be from the Indian Ocean, actually clustered with the individuals of um, the Atlantic Ocean, and then that just made me that I just need to increase my sample size, and use more markers and more energies to actually um, split this particular class, because the spectrum one explains most of the molecular areas, that's why we, we separate them like based on that into two classes. However, you can go again and separate that one into two other classes based on that on that plane and that factor two, which explains most of the molecular areas where you see that your lama on the population, the Robin Island populations, seem to cluster differently from the rest of the population that have a bay, Japanese bay, as well as full bay, which obviously might get supports the hypothesis of the big weather barrier, which is six G flow. To additionally this, uh, assess the population differentiation was that we used uh, the Bayesian clustering analysis. Now with this method is that uh, the program, you, you, you assume that you, you, it just considers that you only have one population, and then it sifts through the data to try and find the, popu the ancestral populations which your current population may have descended from, and then in that it gives you <coughs> two colors, like it, it will give you a number, what the probable number of populations are, and then we can take it to be them two, and then we've got the green population as well as the red population. And we can and then we can see here again that the Devon population seems to be very representative of the red population, whereas the other population are got a, a net mixture of the both the green and the red, and then the Jeffreys Bay obviously showing similar patterns with the Atlantic population. And this might actually we still need to actually look at the population in more detail. So just to conclude is that uh, we detected comparable levels of genetic diversity across the study populations, but most importantly that we were able to actually um, detect a moderate as well as large um, levels of population differentiation, and as a result we, uh, we managed to actually identify at least two digital management units, and therefore uh, consequently the hypothesis of the mexia was actually rejected. And since uh, my project also aims to actually characterize microsatellite markers for genetic studies of the of the muscleless muscleless, since in the near future we also want to actually study the genetic mating system of the species, which is cycle of multiple fertility as well as reproductive collaboratory. And um, my project mostly focuses on the Lamabonda boom population, where we will be testing for temporal variation, which is interpopulation genetic changes over time, and we'll be able to compare those estimates with, with all of the sampling populations along the South African coast. And preliminary observation has it that this Lamaponda boom population is actually phenotypically or morphologically distinct from the rest of the sampling populations along the South African coast. And therefore, we also set out to actually test if whether this population is selectively adapted to its environment or is it just a mere fact of phenotypic plasticity. Since I cannot say with certainty whether there was a reduction in the genetic diversity estimates, is that I would have to go back after increasing my sample size to actually, to actually estimate the historic as well as the contemporary effective population size since it's the critical parameter of population genetics as since it is um, the way it is indicates the rate of loss of genetic diversity and the effective population size is actually the genetic number of individuals in the population that made to produce uh, the, the second generation in contrast to your in contrast to your consensus size which is just the head count of the individuals. And we will be also evaluating and then we'll also be doing a population bottleneck a reduction in genetic diversity as a result of reduction <coughs> in um, in population size, and then at the end of the poll, hopefully using other research outputs, is to be able to formulate recommendations <coughs> for integrated conservation management program for the dinosaur shark species. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge the NRA for funding, but most importantly, our lab and molecular project research group for all their technical assistance and guidance for all of my, all of my project. Mm, thank you.